and welcome to uh, another series in a multiple series episodes of uh, Discover Los Banos. As you recall, we did a, a general summary of the history of Los Banos in two parts. Um, we're back today with um, Dan Nelson once again. Today we're actually at the Milliken Museum, which is located uh, at uh, the east end of Pacheco Park on Pacheco Boulevard. Uh, right next to the football stadium. If you're ever interested, you can come down here. We'll give you more details on that uh, as we get a little bit further into this. But today specifically, we're going to talk about this gentleman right here. You can recognize his face. This is Henry Miller. He basically um, is why the city of Los Banos exists today and a lot of the agriculture that exists today is because of Henry Miller. Um, so today, I'm going to set this down and uh, introduce Dan Nelson. Uh, again, if you've watched the, uh, the other uh, series, you've seen uh, Dan and you kind of know his history. Dan, just kind of fill us in a little bit of your connection to the Milliken Museum and some of your, your connection to the, uh, the local uh, area. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm one of several volunteers here at the museum and uh, uh, have been working uh, as a volunteer at the museum for about 20, 25 years. Uh, my family goes way back in, uh, in Merced County history. Uh, my great-grandfather came out to farm south of Dos Palos in the Oro Loma area in the late 1800s and 1880s. And, uh, and so my family has been a presence in Merced County for uh, about 140 years. Amazing. Yeah. Still, I, I hear that all the time. It's like crazy. That is just insane. Um, and then how did you um, kind of get brought into the Milliken Museum? <laughs> you know, I started uh, Charles Sawyers, the late Charles Sawyers, uh, who uh, was the key administrator of the, of the museum for many, many years, uh, asked if I would come down and, uh, and volunteer one day, uh, one, one day each weekend, uh, every Saturday. And so I came, started doing that, like I say, about 25 years ago. And uh, I started, you know, reading a lot of the archives that were here at the museum, and I, I just got hooked. And, uh, and so I've been uh, just kind of, you know, a student of West Side history and, and local Los Banos history ever so it since. Hooked, yeah. It did. It did. <laughs> it's a really colorful, interesting sure. history. You know, and, and that's. Uh, I just enjoy it. Definitely, so. and that yeah. is one of the reasons why I felt compelled to try and pursue this project it is exactly that, because I'm semi-historic history buff, and um, I knew there was some rich history here. I had heard bits and pieces since I moved here in 89, and um, you know, as I began be become to know people that are more tightly connected and deeply and long-term long connected to this town, I hear, hear more and more colorful stories about the history of this town. But primarily, we're here to talk about today is the man, Henry Miller, who he was, his real name, his birth name, let's say, uh, family name, and then um, how he got here. We did cover some of that in uh, the two-part series previous mm -hmm. to this, but um, I want to go a little bit more in depth on Henry Miller, the man, uh, his childhood, as much as you know, in what was the town? In Breckenheim, Brecken, Breckenheim, Germany, and um, to the point that he got here, and then some of the influences and some of the family lineage that still exists today uh, that you would never know unless mm -hmm. you heard about the connection. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it back over to you, Dan, and just kind of start with um, Henry Miller's hometown, where he where he was born and raised, and start from there. We'll work his way. To across uh, Europe to the United States. Great. Uh, well, first of all, welcome, welcome to the museum. Thank you, and thank, thank you. you for your your project. I yes, think it's sure. a I think it's a good project, and I uh, commend you and the others that are involved in My Lost Banis. That's yeah, uh, perfect. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a great project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, starting starting back at Henry Miller's birth. Uh, Henry Miller was born in 1827 in Breckenheim, uh, Germany. And he was uh, he was born to a butcher, and he uh, and he had two or three sisters. But uh, he helped his father quite a bit with the uh, with the butcher business, 
And um, he actually, uh, in Germany, they had a very formal apprentice program uh, to become a butcher. And he actually began that, you know, as early as eight years old, he started this apprentice program. And it, it, it was a really thorough program um, uh, about fine arts being, being a butcher, I guess. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and he was, you know, he picked it up, he picked it up really well, and his father relied on him quite a bit. Um, as a kid, uh, you get the sense that he was somewhat of an awkward kid, socially, didn't have any friends, and uh, spent a lot of time working, and um, didn't really like school. Um, there were comments by his teacher that he had just a phenomenal memory, but, and, and a, certainly uh, excelled at math, uh, but he just didn't really like it. And, he didn't have uh, what what um, didn't appear to have a very happy childhood. Uh, most of it was working, and uh, and his father uh, was fairly demanding. And uh, he was close to his mother, but when she passed away, uh, he was fairly young, and things just kind of got worse from there. Um, the, uh, the final straw <laughs> was uh, around when he was 14. Apparently. Uh, his father had him herd some geese, uh, you know, from one area to another area, and he found that really demeaning and, oh, wow. and thought it was intentional of his father to demean him. And so he left. He, he, he left at the age of 14, uh, went to Holland and England. Not a lot is known about, you know, what, it, what he did as a 14 year old sure. yeah. in, in, in Holland and England, uh, but ultimately ended up in, uh, in New York um, as, you know, a 17 year old in, in, uh, in New York and, uh, and made his way into the butcher business there. Actually, he was just helping out at different butcher shops. And that sort of thing while he was uh, while he was there in New York. So what was the that was circa eighteen? Yeah, that would be uh, in, in about eighteen forty, okay. yeah, eighteen the early eighteen forties. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so uh, um, he uh, so in summary, uh, Henry Miller, you know, as a child uh, didn't have you know what you would say is a very happy childhood. Did a lot of work and. Right and didn't really appreciate his situation, didn't really like school, didn't have a lot of friends, uh, was regarded as being smart, but he didn't really apply himself. And, uh, and he uh, noted later that he never really felt in place in Germany. Hmm. He, and and to, to be aware of that when he sure. was a kid, you know, but he just knew that that wasn't, you know, the place for him. And, and he, he said he could remember frequently dreaming of leaving and leaving Germany, wow. you know, throughout his childhood, and he did. Right. He, he left at a, at a fairly young age, so. Wow, there was some kind of driving force that he didn't know was driving. Didn't know, yeah. didn't know, but, uh, yeah, yeah, but he, uh, but he was regarded, you know, as a good apprentice in sure. the butcher business there in Germany, and mm -hmm. uh, he was highly regarded for his work, work ethic, uh, but, uh, but he left, ultimately ended up in New York, was there for a few years, and... Uh, now, he lived in New York as, not Henry Miller, but... Yes, he did, he did live there as Henry Miller. Oh, he did? Yes, he did. He or arrived did? in Henry, uh, as okay. Henry Miller, and he was okay. there for a few years. Uh, initially, he couldn't find a... Uh, he needed work, and couldn't find anyone that would take him on as a butcher. There were okay. a lot of immigrants moving in sure. to New York in that time frame, so jobs were really hard to come by. So he was actually a gardener for a while, for about a year, maybe two years, really? there in New York before he finally, you know, hmm. got in, you know, he was a, a helper at a butcher shop, but yeah. uh, uh, decided when the gold rush, you know, uh, broke out in California that, you know, that was some opportunity. So he and a friend, uh, and, and by the way, he was born as Henry, Henry Kreiser, Kreiser, was his name, Heinrich Kreiser. Okay. And uh, so Heinrich Kreiser and a friend decided they were going to uh, go to California. So they began, uh, his friend had some money, and so his friend bought a ticket, and Henry Miller was still saving his for his ticket, and his friend came to him and said, you know, I'm not going to go for, I, I don't know the reason, but he wasn't able to go, 
and do you want my ticket? And uh, Heinrich Kreiser said, well, yes, and, but it was a non-exchangeable, uh, transferable ticket, and his friend's name was Henry Miller. And so okay. uh, he took his friend's ticket with the name of Henry Miller and, uh, and, and became Henry Miller and right. traveled uh, to California and, uh, and kept the name, you know, ever since. Sure. I think it was so, at a time when the immigrants were trying to become more right. American, sure. and so instead of Heinrich uh, Heinrich Kreiser, you know, yes. being Henry Miller, you know, uh, that could have been part of the motivation. Sure. I'm not sure, but I, I would think so. Mm -hmm. So, what was the route that he took from New York to California? Yeah, he went down just... th uh, uh, around South America and and through the Panama Canal, and uh, and they uh, at that point. Um, he got sick there in Panama, and uh, he was there in Panama for several months, and uh, most of it he was sick. He actually started a little business while he was there in Panama, and he later noted that had he not gotten <coughs> sick, he probably would have just stayed in Panama because he was doing wow. you know all of the imagine? all of the immigrants moving through sure. that area needed meat. St yeah, and right. So sure. He he had developed you know a pretty good business there before wow. he got sick, and. Uh, uh, and so he, he was he was very very ill uh, while he was there in Panama and was there several months and ultimately ended up uh, in San Francisco in September of 1850. Okay. Showed up in San Francisco uh, with two dollars in his pocket. And, and, and how did that, that happen? Because he had traveling money. He, he did, he, and when right. he got sick in Panama, I pretty much, you know, uh, it drained him. yeah, pretty much drained. And he didn't have much when right. he when he left New York. He didn't have much, and uh, but but uh, he he arrived in San Francisco with now, a couple bucks. Do you know if he had any acquaintances or otherwise that no, he knew he, in San Francisco? No, he didn't know anybody. He didn't okay, have so a friend. He did, again, he uh, didn't own. have any relatives. Didn't have a friend. Didn't have anything other than sort of his will and uh, perseverance and work ethic. Sure. Incredible work ethic. Yeah, definitely. Uh, especially for leaving the family at eight, at fourteen. Yeah. Um, amazing. That's. He uh, amazing. so in San Francisco, sure. and this is you have to put yourself at that time, and this is the gold rush, and you know all the immigrants are coming through San Francisco, buying all their supplies and heading out to the gold fields mm -hmm. and. So he saw an opportunity there, and he immediately was able to get uh, a uh, a job uh, at a at a local meat market. And uh, what put him over the top apparently is there was a project that his meat market took up of butchering some hogs. And normally the you know you could butcher about eight hogs a day type thing. Uh, he he butchered sixty hogs in one day and and did a really good job. That he got a lot of people's attention. Right then, right and uh, and they recognized his abilities, and uh, he slept right, you know, right uh, right at the behind the the butcher shop that he worked at, wow. and he, the the butcher was kind of older, and so he kind of said, you know, whatever you want to do, and he cleaned it up and painted it, and and uh, and and you know, really really increased the business, and uh, and ultimately took it over. Um, and within three to four years, he was purchasing large quantities of uh, for for you know high amounts of dollars. Yeah, he did really good in, sure. in three or four years. He was able to build a lot of capital and actually buy herds of cattle at that point. Wow! Yeah, by the and mid fifties. By the mid eighteen fifties. Yes. Yeah. And then um, at that point, he uh, where did he where did he house the cat? I mean, where, was it? Uh, were there pasture lands in the San Francisco? Yeah, it, it, well, you, you know, yeah. it was it was the Wild West. Yeah, and, true. And they did have their butcher was right down on the pier and right okay. down on the water and uh, uh, and not not far. There was a ranch called the Bali Ranch that uh, that they were able to keep some. Of them. But a lot of the you know the herds that they would buy, they would just march them through town. Uh, out to the, uh, the to the piers, mm. and uh, right. they uh, had a whole section of where they would do a lot of the uh, the butchering, and okay. yeah, right there in in downtown San Francisco. But they would just march the herd of cattle right down, down the, street. the streets. Yeah, get rid of 
for the market. Yeah. Um, okay, so he held, uh, he actually owned that um, that butcher shop for how long? Uh, it was it was uh, several years, and ultimately, you know, I mean, he owned it until his death. But I mean, oh, you know, right. he improved upon it, and, sure. and uh, especially the butcher yard burnt down that he originally had actually burned down in the 1906 earthquake, oh, wow. and so everything was rebuilt after that. But but way prior to that, um, he he met a, a, another a fellow German named Charles Lux, and Charles Lux. Um, was kind of a high society uh, San Francisco guy and uh, a banker, financer, and but he also was involved in the meat business, mm. and he recognized, you know, Henry Miller's uh, abilities, and uh, they they uh, had a joint venture. Their first venture was going out and buying a herd of cattle uh, as a partnership, and they made a lot of money doing it. And ultimately, they formed a formal partnership of, mm -hmm. of Miller and Lux. And uh, so uh, there was kind of the odd couple. Uh, Henry Miller was sort of this brash, you know, <laughs> uh, character, uh, you know, hardworking. And uh, Charles Lux was the um, the high society, More banking, financial sure. institution kind of guy. And uh, so, you know, it actually over time, you know, worked out to be a really good partnership. Yeah. But they were uh, kind of the uh, odd couple, you know. That's <laughs> they funny. They both wow. they both brought to the partnership certainly different attributes. Yeah, it's kind of that yin and yang thing. Yeah. Almost. He he commented later in a in a in an in an interview, in the only interview that he ever did in his life with Bancroft. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bancroft interview, he commented that he had absolutely nothing in common. Uh, with either looks or values or <laughs> demeanor with Charles Lux, and, uh, but, <laughs> that's funny. but but you know they got along and they made it work. Wow, that's that's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so they both uh, were residing in San Francisco at the time. Yeah, they were. They started this butcher, this meat business mm -hmm. in San Francisco, and um, Henry Miller noticed, you know, their, their, that, the, that the quality of the beef he was getting, you know, wasn't all that good, and so he started wondering about, uh, you know, maybe raising their own beef and and finding some of the best, better beef breeds that were starting to show up in the area and seeing if he could expand on that. And that caused him to start venturing out of the city uh, out to where the cattle were, you know, uh, the cattle were being raised. And uh, ultimately that led him here on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley uh, where he purchased his first land, he and, he and Lux purchased their first land uh, out in the valley uh, in 1863. And uh, they purchased uh, the Santa Rita Ranch, which was part of uh, a, a Mexican land grant. And he purchased that in 1863 from the Hildreth brothers. And, uh, and uh, a big, a, a beautiful ranch uh, just east of Los Banos uh, and north of Dos Palace, up along the San Joaquin River. And so, he had all he had the San Joaquin River for water, and he had all of the uh, the grazing land, uh, the overflow. The San Joaquin, you know, he used to overflow quite a bit, and so you know that overflow would would raise grasses. So it was just a beautiful area to be able to raise uh, his beef, you sure. know. And that was the first ranch that he bought. And how many at that? What was that um, initial acreage? Um, the, the Mexican land grant itself was 44,000 acres, but he, he initially purchased several thousand of that and then ultimately ended up owning the whole 44 over the course of the next several years. Sure. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so uh, that was the Santa Rita? Santa Rita Ranch. Ranch. Yeah. And um, what made him look uh, to kind of the region where Los Banos and Volta are today. What, what made him come back west a little bit from where that ranch was? Yeah, well, ultimately he, uh, he that, that, that Mexican land grant included the lands okay. uh, north of Los Banos and out by the Hereford Ranch and where the Bowles family current, which are heirs of his, where, where they currently farm. That was all part of that land grant. 
And okay. so, although the ranch headquarters was in Santa Rita, which is several miles to the east, the, that land, you know, reached over to the northwest and just north of Los Banas. And okay. so, um, so he, you know, this, and he, and he just, he, he, he just started buying land as fast and furious as he could. Sure. Uh, he, he uh, you know, noted many times that, uh, you know, that they're not gonna make any more land and there's gonna be, the population of California is going to explode. And right. so, you know, and he, uh, he purchased land throughout his whole life. And so, as a cliche, he was a visionary. He was a visionary, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's a, that's but he wasn't. He wasn't. He was a visionary, but not a speculator to mm -hmm. that, to that extent. Um, uh, he uh, he purchased lands for the purpose of supporting his meat business. Sure. And and so it wasn't purchasing lands. He he knew that the value of the lands was good, but sure. that wasn't the intent. That the purchase of lands were to expand his meat. Right. The more land he had, the more cattle he could raise. Exactly, right. Right. that's sure. exactly right. And yeah. so, true businessman. He was <laughs> at his core, almost to a fault. At the end, he was at his core in the meat business. Right. Period. He was, was he, and and that's where all of his investments, all of his activities, everything was focused on supporting that business. Wow, amazing! Um, is there any um, is there any remnant of the Santa Rita Ranch? At this yeah, time? there is. There, there is. is. Okay. There's actually the Santa Rita Ranch. Some of the main barns are still there. If you were what to road go out Highway 152 mm -hmm. um, to Indiana Road and uh, take Indiana Road to the north, it's just about a half mile off of Highway 152. You'll see all the eucalyptus trees, mm -hmm. and um, there was a big, huge uh, slough. Uh, the Santa Rita Slough that ran through the middle of that ranch. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it broke off from the San Joaquin, you know, upstream and uh, and ran through the uh, the Santa Rita Ranch, and wow. it's, it, it was a beautiful ranch site. Interesting. Uh, we'll we'll actually see if we might be able to uh, do some footage uh, of where that currently exists. If um, any fledgling uh, history buffs watching this or interested in uh, locating where that original ranch was. Uh, we'll try and tie in some of that video with, uh, with this interview and, and actually kind of maybe do a, a, an on-site uh, uh, shot of, of where that is and how to get there. Um, that would be pretty cool to, to see that part of it. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 at this time, it was Henry Miller that was doing most of the land buying for sake of expanding his cattle business and Lux was pretty much just doing the books at the time. Yeah, um, and like I say, they, they, they complemented each other's. Uh, uh, Lux was very contented to stay in San Francisco, and uh, they both had homes in San Francisco. Uh, by the way, they married, uh, Henry Miller married uh, Charles's Lux sister-in-law. Oh, wow. And, uh, and so they were, they were tied together, you know, in, in a lot of different ways, mm -hmm. uh, business and family. But, uh, but Charles Lux was very content uh, and a city guy and liked the hobnobbing right. and uh, liked that part of it. And Henry Miller, you know, didn't want any part of, you know, hobnobbing and high society in San Francisco. Sure. Uh, that just wasn't his his forte, and yeah. uh, and he just loved the you know the ranching aspect and mm -hmm. and the business aspect of it, and uh, and he just thrived in developing his ranches and the land and the cattle you know out in the out in the field. And so he was that true cattle baron that everybody refers to. He was. Him. He was. So what? Um, so now you mentioned that he married uh, Lux's sister-in-law. And who was that? Um, Do you remember the name? Yeah, I, I, I believe her name was, was Nellie, and okay. she, uh, she, uh, she, she died at childbirth. She, was, she, she got pregnant, and when she was get, having a child, she died, and the child died as well. And then uh, Henry Miller uh, married his, or, or, uh, her niece, hmm. uh, Sarah, and, uh, and so Sarah, uh, Sheldon, Sarah Sheldon, and uh, so she became Henry Miller's wife, and uh, and all of, and they had three kids. And that was all at the Santa Rita Ranch. 
Yeah, actually, no, that was all in San Francisco. Oh, it was? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. So he would go back to San Francisco where the headquarters was right. at that time. That's quite a trip to do. Yeah, that. well, yeah, yeah. So all like, all oh my horse or, sure. or by, he, he went by buggy, but, oh, wow. uh, but yeah, they had a house in San Francisco, and that's where she, she was from and raised in San Francisco. Okay. And so, okay. uh, well, uh, her family was from the East Coast, but, but, but she had been pretty much raised in San Francisco. Okay, but. So she, they had a house there, a very nice house there, but Henry Miller spent most of his time out here in the valley. Okay. Yeah. And then he would make trips back. He'd make trips back, and they had three kids, but you know, they were pretty much raised out there in, in, the, in, in, in the city. Okay. Yeah. And the names of those three kids were? Yeah, the oldest one was Henry Miller Jr. Uh, didn't really get along with Henry Miller Sr. Um, you know, didn't really get a lot of time out of Henry Miller Sr. and ultimately, you know, was involved apparently in a lot of alcohol and, and uh, died of syphilis in his early 30s. So uh, really not, uh, and then his, uh, his youngest daughter apparently was his favorite daughter and, uh, and she died in a horse accident. You know. What was her name? Her name was Sarah, Sarah Ellis, okay. and she uh, she died in a in a horse accident at seven years old, and uh, and really traumatized Henry Miller. And then his, uh, his the older daughter Nellie uh, was the daughter that all of the lineage of Henry Miller come from from, ah, from Nellie okay. Miller, the uh, the oldest daughter. Right. Now, so we'll. Uh We'll get into that segment of the, the history. Let's go back to the youngest daughter, Gussie, is what yeah. they used to call her, right? Her nickname was Gussie. And speculation is Gustine? Yeah, no, there, there is that speculation, and, and there, you know, there, there is, uh, it's not a consensus that right. that's where the name comes from, but certainly there's a lot of speculation that because Henry the name Miller Gustine, that yeah, Henry yeah. Miller started the city of Gustine. Oh, he did, okay. And, uh, and he did nickname his youngest daughter, Gussie, and so it's been thought that uh, that's likely where the name of Gustine came from. Okay, very yeah. good. Um, and I also want to step back a little bit to um, really the influence further out from just the, the west side of San Joaquin and actually back over west into Santa Clara County. Um, Bloomfield? Yes. Can you kind of elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. And where, where Bloomfield Road is now. Yes. And what, what that has, what any kind of connection that has to do with Henry Miller, because yeah. it does. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it does. Um, Henry Miller, uh, well, when you think uh, about him having a ranch out here in the valley and, and raising a lot of cattle here, he used to run those cattle over the Pacheco Pass and then up into San Francisco for, you know, uh, to be butchered. And, uh, and so um, having a place in Gilroy, which was kind of in the middle of all that, made a lot of sense to him. And so he actually built uh, a, uh, a big, beautiful ranch house called the Bloomfield Ranch uh, near Gilroy. And, uh, and at that time, his wife did move and spent most of her time with the kids at the Bloomfield Ranch, and so that was actually they moved from San Francisco oh, okay. to to that ranch, and uh, but that was just kind of the halfway point from sure. moving his cattle, you know. Yeah, to, definitely. Uh, right. He would raise them here, and then, and then gradually move them to the butcher yards. Right. And he had another ranch. Uh, I think it's called the Bali Bali Ranch in South San Francisco, and uh, that's also where they would would uh, herd the cattle in South wow. San Francisco before taking him into the city for butcher. Amazing. Yeah. And so that, and that's of course the namesake of Bloomfield Road. Yes. Uh, that connects the Tiener yeah. with 152. Any, any commuters that have driven past Bloomfield these days, uh, you, you now know that there is still, even though you curse the traffic at that intersection sometimes on Fridays, <laughs> and I know it, I lived it, uh, that there's a connection, a Henry Miller connection, which is a Los Banos connection. So it's kind of, an interesting little um, little segment of knowledge there, and that's where that's where Gussie had her had her horse accident. Oh, her, okay. And that's where she was killed. Okay. Was at the Bloomfield Ranch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's tragic. Yeah. Um, 
So, uh, were there other homesteads that he built that he liked and uh, up until his death? Did he oh, have yeah, no, he was acquiring land throughout his whole life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, initially Santa Rita was the home ranch, but ultimately he moved that to here in Los Banas, the Canal Farm Ranch, okay. uh, where the Espanas restaurant is currently at today. Okay. A lot yep. of that, those buildings there, you know, go back to... Uh, go back to the Henry Miller, but they had a big, big ranch right there called the Canal Farm Ranch. Okay. And that became his, um, well, I, I don't know if it was his favorite ranch, but he certainly spent most of his time there. He called it his base ranch. Okay. And so he, he spent a lot of time at that ranch and, and they had quarters for him and he had a, a you know, a home there. Sure. And uh, so he did spend a lot of time here, but um, he, acquired land in, in, in a whole bunch of different ways and it's kind of it, it actually is kind of uh, a uh, interesting story but he yeah, back then you know California was wide open sure. in the 1850s and 60s and 70s you know it was wide open the land you know right. uh, everyone was coming out to get you know get get their claim to some land at that time uh, the government used to give out what they what's referred to as script and um, if you were in the military and you were in the military for any length of time, you could get some land script. And any place where the government, you know, where, where land hadn't been claimed yet, you could use this, this script in order to get some land. Well, he would, he would go out and purchase this script, uh, you know, pennies on the dollar from anyone who had any script uh, for whatever reason. There, and there were several different government-sponsored scripts sure. that were out there. And uh, he would go out and he had people working for him just going out and buying script and wow. getting land. So, uh, so he, would, he would get land that way. He would, you, know, uh, you could homestead 160 acres. As the stories go, he would have a lot of his employees go out and homestead and turn the land over to him. And, Interesting. Yeah, and, uh -huh. Very uh, good. and so th that's how another way. Uh, there's one, <laughs> there's one infamous story about uh, him using the Swamp Act. Swamp Act, uh, and, and very, very generally, uh, says that uh, you can uh, claim uh, they, they, the Swamp Act. The intention was to reclaim swamp land to good agricultural ground, and that was the intent of Congress when it passed the Swamp Act. It wanted to reclaim some some swamps mm -hmm. where they could be useful lands. And uh, so uh, and one of the provisions was uh, you could have as much land as you could row across, uh, you, as you could take a rowboat across in a day. And so uh, everybody that knows the San Joaquin Valley knows that it can be the swamp in the, in, in the wintertime, but in the summertime it dries. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's right. a dry sure. desert type terrain and so the, as the story goes he uh, put an axle and uh, put, a, put a rowboat on top and on some wheels and uh, in the summertime he would take it across some land and uh, according to the Swamp Act he could claim that land and uh, so I, you know and, and, and there's That's debate great. on whether that you know really yeah, occurred or not right. but I think you know the myth uh, gives you a sense of sure. his creative ways, whether it's true or not. Right. Uh, the point is he was very creative and aggressive on obtaining land. Sure. <laughs> well, all with, again, to, not to own the land specifically, but just he could graze more cattle. Exactly. Oh, the, yeah. No, yeah, that, that was exactly about, it. No, everything well, was, was the value of my land is going to make me a lot of money. It was, I need more cattle to raise. Everything was about the cattle business and, that's and increasing the cattle business. Yeah. So I'm and being able to compete with the, you know, the the meat business that was developing in sure. Midwest Chicago. Oh you know, yeah, right. Chicago yeah. yeah. mercantile, um, probably down south too, Texas. And yeah. Other places, Oklahoma. Yeah. Um, that's funny. Now, did he have some property uh, even further west on the western side of the Santa Clara County? Uh, Mount Madonna. Yes, he did. Up in the up in the high ridges of uh, the the mountain ridge between, say, Gilroy, the coastal range between uh, Gilroy and the coast. Sure. Uh, there's an area up there, and uh, he built uh, kind of a getaway of uh, three or four houses up there. 
Uh, now it's a state park, Madonna State Park, and you can still go up there and find the foundations of the old buildings. But he built wow. three or four buildings up on top of above Gilroy on, wow. on Madonna and, uh, and had a getaway you know, up there and utilize that. He and his family would utilize that quite a bit. Yeah, so that again is, illustrates the, the breadth of, of his presence, not just here in Los Benos, west, west side of the San Joaquin Valley, but even um, as far west as uh, halfway between uh, Gilroy and Hollis. Yeah, like he, used to, he used to like to uh, note that he could uh, start off in, in Southern California and go all the way up to Oregon and sleep on his property uh, you know every night and he by the time he passed away he had over a million and a half acres and uh, and and again this is all from someone who uh, just just uh, started from scratch uh, in his yeah yeah a few dollars in his pocket by the time he he passed away in 1916 and uh, about one and a half million acres yeah, it also says a lot about his work ethic and his business sense. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, uh, Henry Miller the person is um, <laughs> is a really, really interesting character, um, and and a dichotomy in, in, in many many ways. Um, he um, there were times when he was ruthless, uh, especially about business. And then there were times when he was so gracious and uh, and caring and magnanimous and and he uh, uh, and and you know and there and, and sure. it, 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 it's it's just you know incredible to see uh, the the contrast of right. his personality you know like I say when it came to business it was business but when it didn't have to deal with business. He, he was always helpful to those that were down and out. Mm -hmm. And he built, you know, built public buildings for the towns. He developed towns and gave them over to the cities. And uh, uh, and so he was he was just a, a very interesting, so he was, very he was interesting character. Somewhat generous as well. Very generous. Um, and giving back a little bit here and there. Um, in, in, in that, let's talk about some of that some of his character on that side of things, not the, not the, not the aggressive business side. Yeah. Um, uh, well, the biggest thing that stands in my mind is the, basically the party, the, 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 the festival, I don't know what you want to call it, that he did in May to uh, all of the, his ranch hands, his foremen, his fa the, and their families and stuff that they had the big, the big blowout, which is now what we celebrate as the May Day. May Day, yeah. Yeah. So, kind of talk about that a little bit, because that that exemplifies who he was in terms of appreciating his employees and their families. And right. Family, correct. Yes, and maybe as uh, to put that that into context, um, he bought his first property out here in 1863, as we had mentioned, uh, and so he was developing ranches out here on the west side of the valley, um, and. The old Los Banas, which used to be out on Volta Road, uh, was the center of, uh, of, of all of the, the, the locals would go to old Los Banas. Well, when uh, the railroad came through in 1889, uh, they moved old Los Banas. Henry Miller <laughs> picked up old Los Banas, including the post office, and put it to where uh, Los Banas is presently located and essentially said we want to have the town now near a railroad so sure. he picked it up including, <laughs> including a federal post office and put it where he wanted it wow. and uh, uh, but but he uh, he he, he uh, that first year that he did that he wanted to uh, have a celebration and a big barbecue for all of his employees and all of the people that were starting to move into mm -hmm. To this region at that time, and so he hosted a uh, barbecue at the Canal Farm Ranch, which is where Spanish is today, and he uh, invited everybody in the region, and he supplied all of the beef, and all of the steaks, and all of the uh, all of the bread, and then everyone else brought whatever else they wanted. Sure. But that started in 1890, and we celebrated May Day. Uh, 
since then. Right, yeah. and that's amazing. Yeah. And again, that illustrates um, the kind of man he was in terms of his 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 thankfulness and appreci appreciativeness yes. of his employees and and the citizens coming to help settle this community that he kind of started from. Yeah, you know his yeah. business. Um, it, were, are there any other anecdotes about that that kind of that kind of that side of him? You know, there is. There is. In fact, in fact, uh, there, <laughs> there's a lot of stories about Henry Miller's personality. Uh, just a lot of stories. Um, uh, some of them relate to his anger, uh, temper. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be very common for him to get mad at one of his employees and. Uh, to take his hat and throw it on the ground and stomp on it while he was yelling at it, and, <laughs> and his employees, you know, began calling that the the Henry Miller dance. And uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, he 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 uh, held his employees accountable. Uh, he demanded, uh, you know, perfection from his employees, sure. and he was a stickler for detail, incredible detail. Here you have a million and a half acres, and you know we have memos of him, you know, to his foreman, uh, you know, about you know seeing bent nails that could be straightened out and reused, and oh, wow. <laughs> and you know the untidiness of of different things, and sure. and uh, so uh, the and, and and that's another thing that's probably noteworthy: the stories about his work ethic. He would he he didn't sleep a lot. And he would wake up early in the morning at one of his ranches, and he would immediately start writing memos. He knew he was gonna who he was gonna be seeing that day, and he knew what he what he saw the day before. So he would start writing memos to all of his ranch superintendents, and and we have a lot of those memos, you know, on our in our archives. But uh, the memos would be just the details of what needs to be done at the different ranches. So he would write these memos, have them all delivered, and he would take off. He had a driver, and his driver would, you know, drive him from ranch to ranch to go to go check things out. Right. And uh, and then at the end of the day, you know, he would uh, he would uh, end up at one of another one of his ranches, mm -hmm. and the next morning he would get up and write, you know, hundreds of memos, you know, yeah. of, of directions to uh, to different people. So real quick, we talk about the acreage. Um, at at the end of a million and a half or whatever that he had um, at, before he died, uh, how many total ranches did were there? I mean, at at the peak of all the operation, how many ranches did he actually operate? Oh, you know, I I, I don't have a fix on that number, but it was a lot. Uh, just to give you a sense of that, uh, just between uh, here and Fireball, there were seventeen Miller and Lux ranches. Wow. Yeah, and so there you know, were a lot. Yeah, and and each ranch was its own um, uh, organization and its own entity. It sure. had they had a ranch house, they had a bunk house, they had a general store. Uh, every really? one of their ranches were self-contained. They had a vegetable garden, uh, and so wow, and and incredible. you know it might cover you know each one might cover several thousand acres, but okay. but but they were. You know, everywhere, and and so how many he had in the one and a half million acres? I don't know, but it's a good question because uh, it's how we organize sure. his business. These well, it, ranches exactly. were, you know, the subset of the overall business. The the, the umbrella was Miller and Lux, and okay. each one of his ranches right. was, you know, a self-sustaining entity amongst all of that. Right. I, well, and then the follow-up to that was um, with as many ranches as he had. What are the um, that we know of that you know of the Miller the, the Millican Museum knows of uh, are existing towns today that was a ranch of yeah. Henry Miller's. Now like most of the Miller. most of the towns that surfaced up as a result of Henry Miller uh, actually weren't weren't ranches per se oh. Henry Miller ranches, but they were towns that Miller that Henry Miller started. Okay. Los Banas is a good example of that. Dos Palaces, Firebaugh, Gustine. Uh, they all have one thing in common besides being uh, Henry, Miller and Lux towns. They were railroad towns. All of these towns popped up after the railroad came through in 1889, including Patterson, Newman, 
Augustine, Los Banas, Dos Palas. Prior to that, you had stagecoach stops, right. of which Old Los Banas was a stagecoach stop. Sure. And you also had some um, communities along the San Joaquin River, uh, Hills Ferry, uh, Dover. These were Keys Ferry. These were all little towns that served the steamships that were coming up and down. Right. But once the railroad came through uh, in 1889, the railroad towns popped up. Right. They weren't per se Miller and Lux ranches, but they were Miller and Lux towns. Okay. They served the Miller and Lux ranches, right. okay. and they were along the railroad. So, uh, you know, in summary, then, uh, if if Miller Lux did not have all of the property that they had, those towns may or may not have. Yeah, they probably wouldn't have had the same support, and right. certainly would have. You know, uh, they would have evolved differently. Sure. Right. Henry Miller changed everything. He, him coming to the west side of the valley uh, changed everything. He, uh, he's the one that developed uh, the base for the agriculture that we have today. Uh, he's the one that developed the base for the irrigation that we have for that agriculture uh, today. Uh, he's the one that developed the towns that we still you know, enjoy today. Sure. Uh, Henry Miller uh, changed everything and established everything on the west side of the, the valley uh, from you know the fundamental terrain and agriculture mm -hmm. and irrigation and also how it is we commune you know in the uh, in the city. Yeah, and that's just mind-boggling to even conceive. Yeah, that one man had that much influence on where, where this valley is today. Exactly, um, and, and the vision. And the vision, and right. the vision that he saw for the valley. The, so let's move to, uh, a little bit back to his, his um, children, um, and it was the oldest daughter, yes. who was the sole survivor of yes. the three. Nellie. Nellie, and um, so let's kind of branch off a little bit. Now we know, we know Henry Miller up to that point, um, where where does Nellie go from from the time of growing up under Henry Miller? Yeah, well, and she spent a fair amount of time in San Francisco. Excuse me, and and uh, likewise in in the Bloomfield Ranch as well. But she ended up marrying uh, a fellow by the name of J. Leroy Nickel, and uh, they ultimately I can't recall if they had three or four kids, but they had some kids and. Um, and one of the daughters married a Bowles, and to this day we still have, you know, the lineage uh, coming down from the Nickel side of the family and the Bowles side of the family are essentially the lineage that we have, uh, you know, from Henry Miller. Uh, the Nichols Farm um, and San Juan Ranching is the name of their farming organization. They farm down in Bakersfield. They farm over in the Dos Palace area, and uh, uh, and likewise the Bowles family uh, still farms here northeast of Los Banas, several thousand acres. Uh, and both the Nichols and the Bowles families are thought of as leaders uh, in the agricultural industry sure. today. And so all of that comes from uh, you know from Henry Miller's daughter uh, Nellie. Right. Yeah. Wow, amazing. Um, so, uh, at, let's see, so we've got Henry Miller, he's acquired uh, through land grants and other activities uh, up to a million, million and a half, um, moves to Canal Farm. Um, at what point does he start to maybe begin to hand off some of the the business. Um, did he get to a point in his age? Yeah, in the later days, his, his wife died in about 1906, and he was, what, in the mid-70s by then, and um, he, uh, in fact, he would be, he would, he would be you know, 79 in, 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 at that time, uh, and, you know, he began slowing down after that. He never really, you know, formally, you know, turned over the reins. Uh, it was thought, you know, that there were a couple of nephews that were working for him that, you know, that, that you know, would likely take over the business, but apparently, uh, ultimately, Jay Leroy sort of worked his way in there and, and, and became, you know, the heir apparent. But okay. uh, he, he got gout and some other things that just disabled him, and he wasn't able to cover, 
the ground he used to, and ultimately he ended up dying in San Francisco at his daughter's house, Nellie's house. And, uh, but um, there really wasn't any formal, you know, you know, you, you take this over type oh. thing. It just kind of, it was more of an evolution he, of the business as opposed basically to. Basically, he wanted to re retain control as long as he could. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and just, you know, knowing what we do board. about his personality, sure. Sure. It, it's not really, not yeah. really surprising. Mm -hmm. And then, what happened to Charles Lux uh, along the way? Yeah, Charles Lux passed, uh, uh, he passed away actually uh, uh, fairly young. He passed away, I believe, it was in the 1880s, and it, uh, and, and, and fortunately, he and Henry Miller had entered into an agreement that if one of them were to pass away, uh, all of the management of the organization would go to the other, hmm. and, and that they would have control over the organization and then, you know, and, but there would be a split. I mean, there, sure. there, there's certainly the heirs of either one would benefit from them, but, but the control of the organization would go with the other. And that agreement, uh, you know, probably saved the continuity of Miller and Lux after Charles right. Lux died. Because uh, the Charles Lux heirs, <laughs> you know, they all surfaced and right. wanted to participate. Sure. Sure. And Henry Miller was able to maintain control over the organization, ultimately was able to buy them out, and uh, uh, but that happened in about the 1880s. Okay. Yeah. Um, so then, with his death and um, kind of subsequent, I don't know, handoff to the nickel arm of the, the lineage, um, what what became of most of the land? Yeah, uh, you know, there was a lot of land that was sold in the 30s, uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s. A lot of land was sold. And um, and it was a combination, you know, at, as we have discussed, Henry Miller was in the meat business. Everything he did was to promote the meat business. Well, the irrigated agriculture that had evolved as a result of him building canals um, out in this region, allowed folks to diversify in agriculture. In other words, they didn't have to rely on grazing. They could grow, they could grow row crops sure. and orchards, and uh, they could diversify in agriculture. And Henry Miller would never do that. Uh, and ultimately, you know, that started hurting uh, the business. Uh, in addition to that, you had the expansion. Uh, I think it was Hormel family out of Chicago that, that you know, an expansion of their meat business. Oh, sure. But you had competition and right. refrigeration, uh, which allowed the meat business to be mm -hmm. you know, more broad spread. Um, and so there was more competition. Uh, and then taxes, you know, after he passed away, the taxes. Mm -hmm. And so the combination of all of those things, you know, didn't, uh, didn't, allow there to be a smooth transition from Henry Miller's death to the company, you know, continuing on. And so they ended up selling a tremendous amount of land in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, ultimately, as, as I recall, there was a split between the Nichols and the Bowles families in the 50s, and, uh, and, 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 but a building up of the business from that point on. Uh, each, each business, sure. and they they become very very stable at oh. that point. Right. But uh, I would say probably the era of the twenties through the forties was fairly that transitional area okay. era post uh, post uh, Henry Miller's death um, was not a stable transition. Okay, so um, in in fact I wanted to bring this up as well. Um, uh, we just passed. We just passed a, a milestone uh, that, unfortunately, nothing was was was. I don't think anything in this town was mentioned. Um, we're we're right now we're videotaping in, in the beginning of January, but October uh, twenty seventeen. That what date was that? That was the the historical. Uh, yeah, September. he he died. I believe it was in October. Uh, he died nineteen sixteen. I, I believe it was October and. And so last year, uh, you know, was the hundred-year marker of uh, of his death, and uh, th I think we wrote an editorial just noting that. Oh, okay. and, but beyond that, there wasn't, wasn't really any any real public uh, 
note of his passing, but uh, yeah, it certainly was, you know, over the last hundred years and for him to still have the influence, you right. know, uh, that he's had on the region uh, is pretty phenomenal. It, it is. Uh, um, and I've got to say, you know, uh, as as much of an influence and, and the, the, he basically developed the entire San Joaquin Valley as we know it from as far south as San Diego, right? And potentially up to the Oregon border in the central part of the state. Yeah, it is. Um, and uh, for not hearing much about him unless you do some research mm -hmm. or you, t you find somebody like you or the Milliken Museum here in Los Banos or you might see a plaque on the Espanas building, um, there's not really much known about his influence. What he actually did in the 1800s between 1800 and, and the early 1900s uh, for the state of California in general. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope that this video series helps enlighten people and maybe we get some more focus from a broader scale mm -hmm. in terms of the significance of, of what Henry Miller had done. And it still exists today with the farming that exists by the Nickel and the Bowles families. Um, and if you're interested in knowing more about Los Banos and the history of the San Joaquin Valley, the western side of the San Joaquin Valley, Milliken Museum uh, is, is a wealth of historical artifacts. Um, I think some of the docents, uh, including yourself, are, have a wealth of information to share, not just of Henry Miller, but of the history of the town itself and the west side. Um, you know, even the files of, uh, of the, um, uh, Mr. Milliken that actually uh, interviewed people mm -hmm. and the actual record of him typing up this, in, this historical information of mm -hmm. people that were um, teenagers, you, you mentioned that, were teenagers back in the early 1900s. Yeah. Yeah. And and some of the connections and some of the other family names, you know, that you may or may not have heard mentioned here. Um, I think that all it exemplifies this just wealth of influence that Henry Miller had, and his, um, you know, him and, and Charles Lux and, and what they did to this to this valley. Um, I recommend coming to the Mil uh, Milliken Museum. It's, it's uh, again, right next to Pacheco Park. It's right adjacent in Pacheco Park, more or less. If you're playing Frisbee and you threw it too hard, the Frisbee too hard, you'd hit the building. <laughs> um, so what was this building initially? This uh, has always been the museum. It's always yeah. been the museum. Th this, this room that we're in right now was the initial museum and Milliken and the city built it in 1854. And then it was expanded into that that broader wing in the '60s at some point. Okay. Um, uh, I, yeah, I, I wanted you to uh, wanted to ask Dan to um, kind of show us some reference material. And yeah, if you're if you're interested in in in, in uh, reading more about Henry Miller, uh, here's some here's some books about him. The uh, the initial classic book about Henry Miller was written by a fellow named Treadwell. And he was Henry Miller, one of Henry Miller's attorneys. And uh, by the way, there's a funny story. There are a lot of funny stories about Henry Miller, but one one of his one of the uh, stories about Henry Miller is this quote: "I I make three fortunes in my lifetime. One for my partner, one for me, one for my partner, Mr. Lux, and one for my attorneys." And <laughs> Treadwell was uh, Treadwell was one of his attorneys and wrote this book in the 30s after after uh, Henry Miller had passed and it's called The Cattle King. Cattle and uh, that was, that's the uh, initial book on Henry Miller. Uh, a fellow by the name of David Igler uh, wrote this, I believe about probably 15, 20 years ago called Industrial Cowboys. And it's about Miller and Lux and the transformation of the far west. This is a really, really thoroughly researched book and uh, is about the business 
of Miller and Lux and how it is that they were organized and how it is that they operated their business in the horizontally and vertically right. wow. uh, integrated. And it's a very thorough book. And so if you're interested about sort of the details of the Miller and Lux, the business of Miller and Lux, uh, this, is, this is a great source. Wow. Um, just, uh, just recently, um, Charles Sawyers uh, from Los Banos, the past curator of the museum, um, put together, uh, as you had referenced, uh, uh, the, that Ralph Milliken had done a bunch of oral interviews back in the 20s and 30s of um, you know, some of the original immigrants that came to this area. Uh, there's about 3,500 pages of those oral interviews, and what Charles Sawyers did was gleaned from those stories, all of those stories about Henry Miller. And so this is uh, called One Man Show, and it really is about the person of Henry Miller and some of the colorful mm. stories about Henry Miller, and, uh, and, it's, and it's more of a localized uh, and personable book. Uh, about uh, Henry Miller. Uh, this, by the way, is because, uh, you know, I don't know how word has gotten out, but we're getting a lot of uh, inquiries from different universities. And, really? Yeah. Wow. And about Amazing. this book. And so it's kind of neat to see it that's, it's that's sort of uh, catching on, especially, yeah. you know. Uh, that's actually pretty cool. Yeah, it's being from Charles, you know. And, sure. it, and it is, it's well done. And it's a whole different type of book than the other, the other two prior yeah. to it. Yeah. And then this is a book that is about uh, one of the legacies that Henry Miller leaves us is uh, not just his water development, but the contributions that he left uh, regarding water law. Uh, there was a, a benchmark case in uh, the late 1870s called Hagen versus Lux. And essentially, uh, without <laughs> getting too far in the weeds, it, it, it was the fundamental case regarding riparian water rights versus appropriative water rights of which, you know, uh, which clash uh, has, those two different types of water rights have clashed throughout California's history. Hmm. And Henry, Miller, uh, Henry Miller's case, uh, Hagen versus Lux, was uh, the defining uh, case about Riparian versus appropriative water rights, wow. and and this is a well-written book called "Flooding the Courtrooms" that are about Henry Miller and his and his water uh, cases that he was involved in. And uh, so they and were so, even doing that way back then. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fighting about water in California is as old as California, and certainly Henry Miller was right in the middle and sure. and uh, was involved in many of the defining cases of, about our water rights. And so those are those are and and here's another one that was done most recently about Valley Empires, and it's about Hugh Glenn who. Uh, uh, was a land baron in Northern California and Henry Miller here in, uh, in, in this region, and that's called Valley Empires. And, Valley Empires. and uh, so those are, those are, and then there's a lot of, you know, uh, uh, articles uh, that have been done about Henry Miller in, in various publications and stuff, but these are the major book resources that I'm aware of. And now, uh, how many are available for purchase that you know of? Yeah, we have Valley Empires here in uh, at the museum. Of course, we have the One Man Show, and uh, that uh, uh, we have that and sell that here at the museum, and we have copies of the paperback Cattle King. Uh, we do not have copies of Industrial Cowboys, uh, but you can get that on the internet, and likewise, flooding uh, the courtrooms. We don't have copies of that for sale, but we do have copies for sale at the museum of the Cattle King and One Man Show. Okay. And Valley Empires. This is uh, University of California Press uh, out of Berkeley. So I think if you went to uh, UC, ucpress.edu, you probably yeah. can find the book yep. where it's located yep. for purchase. And then you have a paperback of this? We do. We have paperbacks yeah. for sale of the Cattle King. Yeah. Perfect. So there's a lot of material that, that that's available, you know, about yeah, Henry Miller. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I, as I said, there's been more interest recently over the course. You're, you're right. 
uh, you get outside of this region and not a lot of folks know about Henry Miller or Miller and Lutz, or when you say Henry Miller, they think you're talking about the author, author. you know? Yes. But, uh, but uh, I, something has occurred over the course of the last 10, 15 years where we're getting many more inquiries about Henry Miller and Miller and Lux, mm -hmm. mainly from universities, and, and, but also from you know, different, different areas. But um, we're getting, there, there seems to be an increased awareness and interest in Henry Miller and Miller and Lux. That could be good and it could be bad. But, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, at least it gets us on the face of the map a little bit more, um, at least from a historical standpoint. Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, come down to the, to the Milliken Museum. Um, Dan, what are the hours? And yeah, days? we're open every day uh, except Mondays, and we're open from 1 to 4. Man, is there an admission or is it donations? No, all donations. In fact, uh, we don't, you know, uh, we don't have any governmental uh, support financing. We do receive a tremendous amount of support from the city of Los Banos and the county of Merced. And uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, uh, but all of our day-to-day uh, -day activities and keeping the doors open and protecting the archives and preserving sure. the archives are all funded through, you know, membership dues and, and, uh, and donations. Very good. Yeah. Uh, you can always use donations, right? Always use donations. <laughs> if, um, if you're interested, uh, come on down. There's so much, there is so much information and visual historical artifacts in this little uh, U-shaped building. In fact, the chairs we're sitting in are from where? Uh, this is, these are chairs from the Gonzaga Ranch, which was an old adobe ranch that uh, is now under San Luis Dam, San Luis Reservoir, and, but it was part of Pacheco's, Francisco Pacheco's uh, Mexican land grant and the first adobe, the first building that was built right. in Merced County. Interesting, and, yeah. you, and here we're sitting in a... Here we are. And you can come and maybe Dan would let you sit in one just <laughs> for whatever, posterity. Uh, Dan, thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you are you. a wealth of information. I've said it time and again. We, we will see you many, many more times. There's so much content in this uh, building itself that um, we will continue to move forward. And um, the next set of uh, episodes in the series of Discover Los Banos will be about um, buildings, historical buildings, um, you know, you heard Espana's as a canal farm uh, ranch. Uh, we'll talk about that a little more in depth. Um, we'll talk to the proprietors of buildings downtown uh, and see, and we're going to work on seeing if we can get some uh, uh, historical images that were taken uh, in the 1800s. Uh, in 1900s of downtown Los Banos and some of the surrounding buildings around Los Banos and what was there originally, it's a, the historical significance of those buildings and what's there today and then again if you're curious or a history buff and have time and you can drive around and check out some of these locations. Um, we did hear just a little snippet uh, about the first jail. It's on an alley off of I Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I hadn't talked to this gentleman right here, I would have never known that it still existed. And um, what we're going to do at this point is, is bid you adieu. And uh, thanks again for, for Dan's time today and the Millican Museum for uh, allowing us to film here. And uh, please keep an eye out for upcoming series. And I uh, hope you guys all have a great day. Take care, and we'll see you in the, in the streets. Bye-bye. Thanks, John.